Well, good evening, everyone. It is great to be here with you all once again. And uh, hey, uh, the last few nights have been wonderful. And tonight, you're probably at home. You're probably sitting there and watching some of the inauguration all the events that happened this morning. It is a day in transition. And I hope that as individuals, we are coming together to pray for our new president and the new president during this transition. Uh, last night, we had the opportunity to hear from Dr. Derwin Gray. We heard from future Hall of Famer New Orleans quarterback Drew Brees. We got a chance to hear from Jennifer Nolan and Gail Rice for a sit-down conversation. And today, you're going to be in store for a lot more as we enter our third section of Dr. King's famous speech. Uh, as usual, before I turn it over to Ed, I want to thank some of our partners, specifically the National Christian Foundation in Chicago, the Ronald Blue Trust Emerging Leaders Initiative, or ELI, Wagamaker and Oberly Renew Chicago, Northern Seminary Resource Global Together LA, and the Grow Center. And so with that, I'm going to drop off. I'm going to turn it over to Ava, Chief Administrative Officer at Northern Seminary, to get us started and open us up in prayer. And then from that point on, Ed will lead you the rest of the way. I'll talk to you all soon. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we pray today from your word. We pray from Amos 5, 21 through 24. And we thank you for your word, Lord. And we speak today about righteousness like a mighty stream. Your word says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Lord, your word speaks to us today. Lord God, let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness, Lord God, like a never failing stream. Help us, Lord, to realize that we have to be real with you. We thank you for your word today, God. Let your word go forth. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray and for his sake. Amen. Thank you, Ava. And welcome everyone to night three of this special week of honoring reflecting on and learning from the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his iconic I Have a Dream speech. I'm your host, Ed Gilbreth, uh, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships for Christianity Today. And it's an honor to be with you again this evening. Tonight's theme is Righteousness Like a Mighty Stream. And it focuses on the third section of Dr. King's speech. The supporting scriptural text we'll use tonight is Amos, chapter five, verses 21 through 24, which concludes, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Let justice roll on. What gets me so excited about this week's series is that we're listening to all of Dr. King's speech, not just the easy parts. Perhaps my number one piece of advice every MLK day and Black History Month for that matter, is for people to listen to the entire I Have a Dream speech because in its entirety, it's even more profound, inspiring, and challenging. In its entirety, we hear a fuller, more holistic message from Dr. King that speaks not only to the soaring call for reconciliation and unity, but also to the gospel's demand for reckoning, repentance, and justice. So 
let's let justice roll down tonight and let us hear more of Dr. King's prophetic words from I Have a Dream. Beginning section three, part of the speech, our reader tonight is Mia Maynard of Chicago. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rose down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. And some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom, left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our Northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. Thank you, Mia. I'm so honored to welcome our first guest tonight. Our special guest is speaker, activist, and author Sarah Collins Rudolph. Sarah Collins Rudolph is a survivor of the 1963 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, which killed her sister and three other girls. She has given numerous talks on her experiences and recently published her memoir entitled The Fifth Little Girl, Sole Survivor of the 16th Street Baptist Church Bombing. In 2002, Ms. Rudolph was honored by the Congress of Racial Equality with a Harmony Award for demonstrating bravery at the time of this tragedy. She has actively pursued justice and restitution. And in 2020, she lobbied for and received a formal apology from Governor Kay Ivey on behalf of the state of Alabama. Ms. Rudolph will be interviewed tonight by William Adjay, Managing Director of CBRE. Please welcome Ms. Rudolph. Well, Sarah Collins Rudolph, I just wanna personally thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you. You have a remarkable story and I'm looking forward to exploring that a little bit more with you. So first of all, just thank you. For having me. Yeah. So, Sarah, as we've been following through uh, each day of this week, diving into Dr. Martin Luther King's speech and the focus for this particular section of his speech um, comes from this passage in Amos, which we will talk about in a little bit. But in his speech, uh, this is the section that we've we've termed or titled righteousness like a mighty stream. And in that section, he focuses on uh, the advocacy around civil rights. And on the one hand, those who keep pushing, keep fighting, keep advocating. And on the other hand, the question from detractors who would say, when will people be satisfied? When is enough? And I wanna ask you, as you think about that particular section, which talks about all these injustices against um, blacks, against minorities, um, what themes hit you personally from Dr. King's uh, speech? Well, one thing, you know, the injustice that has been done, uh, Martin Luther King 
want uh, the gesture to roll down like a, when he said like a mighty river and righteousness like a mighty stream. He meant that we have we have uh, tried and protested and and did everything to try to get our uh, rights, but yet it haven't come yet. So now, you know, it's been so long. Till he he said in that passage that till our justice should roll down like a mighty stream, because we've been going through this for over four hundred years, trying to get these rights, and it's time that they see that we are human, just like they are, and it's time for us to get these justice because uh, people have marched during the during the sixties and and when I was coming up, and yet. We still in that same place. Nothing haven't changed yet for the blacks. Yeah, certainly there's a lot of work left to be done. But but Sarah, you you have fought your entire life uh, pursuing um, advocacy for injustice, both personally for you, but also for um, minorities in general, for blacks specifically. Um, you fought many battles over a long period of time. What has kept you going on and not stopping? Well, you know, when that happened to me and God spared my life, I really believe he was saving me, saving my, so he saved my life for the time of this. Because I know that when I was young, this wasn't what that I, you know, picked for my life. But by God spared me, he wanted me to fight for, for, for justice because uh, going through a bomb like that, mm. uh, it was something that was thrust on me. And I had, my, uh, when I was at the age of 12, I wanted to be a nurse. And that's what I was thinking about. But God wanted me to, to uh, change that and really uh, try to get justice for, for his people because the time is now. And it's time for for white this to stop looking at as us looking at us as being nobody, because we all are somebody in God's sight. He made us in His own image, and we shouldn't be treated the way they have been treating us. It's time for, for us to to uh, have our rights, just like the whites, you know. Yes, indeed. It's it's a, a very important message. And um, you have done this for a very long time in many different places and at many different levels. Can you share about some of the successes that you have had in your battle to advocate for justice? Well, one thing, you know, I, I remember when I was a young girl, you know, I used to... Uh, march with my parents, you know. I didn't do any uh, marching uh, uh, back then, you know, before the bomb because I was 12 years old. So uh, now, nowadays, uh, I began to uh, read, the, read the word of God and just follow his words and, and let the people know it, that's, it's the time, you know, because when God made us, he wanted us to do his work. We didn't just come here for nothing. It's 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 some work to be done, and uh, protesting and and trying to um, make this uh, land better. It's the time now to do it because we see so much now happening to to our uh, black people, and we need to get out and, and make sure that we are. Uh, get people ready to vote and uh, to change these unjust laws. And uh, I uh, want to continue to, to uh, tell the people to get out there when they see, see uh, things that are not going right in their city. We got to say something about it. Pro protest for justice because our time is now. Yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, there's so many different ways that folks can get involved in being part of that loud, persistent and continuing voice, just like you have done for such a long time and uh, admirably so continue to do. And it's a it's a great example and a um, you're a role model for so many people. And thank you for that. One of the uh, takeaways also from Dr. King's speech 
is that he focused very, very heavily um, on scripture. And specifically for this portion of the speech, um, he turned to Amos 5. And there's a passage in there um, that talks about uh, the prophet Amos really speaking the words of God saying um, he hates and despises the religious festivals and the assemblies, the burnt offerings, the choice offerings, the noise of songs and music, uh, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. How does your faith in Christ inform and help you in this mission that you have? My thing, you know, we when we uh, get out to do it, the work of God, we got to always acknowledge him. He said, acknowledge him in all those ways and he will direct our path. So before we do anything for him, we got to pray and uh, we got to uh, ask God to guide us because uh, we can't do it without him, just like Martin Luther King did. You know, when I see seeing him uh in in the 60s that's what we he would do he would tell he, he would kneel down and we would pray we would go to the we would go to the courthouse uh when at least when i was traveling doing that it was with uh fred shuttlesworth you know he he marched with uh, martin luther king mm. but we used to go to the courthouse and we would pray kneel down and pray and, and on our way to the courthouse we would sing and then this really uh, motivated us to do the thing that we could do because we can't do nothing without God. Mm. He come first. He come first in our life, and we got to acknowledge Him in all our ways, all of our ways. Yeah, especially because of how significant the uh, the mission is. The work is so uh, significant that we can't do it on our own, and that's a very helpful encouragement and reminder. Well, most of our listeners may not necessarily know this, but uh, Sarah, you have actually published a book um, that documents your experiences um, and your life story. And I'd love for you to take some time to share a little bit about that book. And uh, also, uh, once you're done, I'll, I'll share some more details so folks can find out how to get a hold of the book and, and purchase it and read it for themselves. But can you share a little bit about, about what you put in the book, uh, how that came about, and what your trying, what your message in the book is? Yes, you know, uh, I had a life before the bombing, so I talk about my life then, how I came up. You know, when I was uh, young, it was a lot of things that the blacks couldn't do. We couldn't even go to the uh, movie theaters and sit down on the uh, first floor we had to go to the balcony i talked about that and also uh bull connor how he was toward the protesters and you know uh he didn't treat the black right because you know the dogs in the uh water holes how that he uh would put on black people simply because they want to march and get the, our rights and uh my book talks about that and how uh, how I, I strive to uh, get the thing that I needed in, needed in life and how I had to get out there sim simply because when I was blinded, you know, and one eye, I still had to get out there and make a life for myself. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when, when a child is, is uh, like that, many people don't uh, hire you because I wanted to go to the army, you know, but they wouldn't accept me simply because I lost my eye. But, uh, and I, I talk about God, how God uh, brought me through. You know, it's a very uh, uh, interesting book because I know that God spared my life to uh, write this book. And, and a lot of young people need to read it because we got to hold on to God. Yeah, and, and Sarah, as uh, the book has come out, have you had any opportunity to interact with other people or some feedback from readers or other people who've received and read through the book? Well, uh, I had a feedback uh, uh, with one of the people, I don't want to mention his name, but he said that he really enjoyed 
my uh, book because uh, there's a lot of things in my book concerning what I had to go through. And like I say, what God brought me through because it was hard coming up, you know. Uh, uh, I wanted to be a nurse. And he was just telling me it was a really important book. Everybody should uh, get it and read it. Because, many, you know, there are not too many uh, people in this world uh, can say they went to a, a ter terrorism, terrorist act in their own city, you know. And uh, when you go through something like that, you just got to trust in the Lord to bring you out. So they need to really read my book. Yeah. And and maybe one more thing about the book, Sarah. Could you share a little bit about your the story behind the book? I think, again, most people don't even know uh, much of your story, your background. And I'd love to maybe for you to give a few minutes of exactly kind of what happened at a high level uh, before we, uh, we, we wrap up here. Well, uh, in 1963, you know, I was in, in, in church and it was a, uh, going to be a youth day program that Sunday morning. And, uh, when I was, when we was waiting for the church to turn out, that's when Denise Magnell, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robson came into the restroom where Ed and I were. And Denise asked her to tie the sash on her dress. And by that time, when Ed had reached her hand out to tie the sash, and all of a sudden I heard this a great sound. And it was real loud. Boom! Hmm. And when, it, when I heard that sound, all I could say was, Jesus, Eddie, 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 I called out and she didn't answer. So uh, I was just shocked because something like that should never have happened. You, you go into church to praise the Lord, but you, you, you go home and you don't have your sister with you because somebody have bombed the church. You know, these kind of people that did this, I know they don't know God. Mm. Because God uh, uh, wouldn't want somebody to put a, a, a bomb in, in his church and, and kill innocent people. So I tell that story and I uh, want the people just to read the whole story because I went through some things that a 12 years old child should never have gone through. But God brought me through. Yeah. And again, uh, you know, I think most people would agree that the world of today in some ways is very different than the world of the 60s. But in other ways, we're still battling and fighting the same uh, challenges that we've had back then. So my, my encouragement to the listeners is for you to uh, take a, a chance to visit Sarah's website. It's sarahcollinsrudolph.com. And you can get a glimpse of not only her story, but uh, there are links there to purchase her book. And the book is titled The Fifth Little Girl. And again, it's released. It's available on Amazon. It's available on her website. Um, and you can get all the information that you need from that. But it's a really, really wonderful piece of history and a great story that we should all be reminded of. It does bring us back to Dr. King's speech. And in this portion of the speech, he just focuses on all the at the time, all the atrocities, all the injustices that people were facing. Um, Sarah, maybe for the last few minutes here, what are some of the uh, most concerning injustices that you see uh, today? Maybe different than the 60s, but some of the things that you see uh, today that concern you the most? Well, the thing, thing that I see today is police brutality. And you know, when I see this, it hurts because they don't have to kill us like that. You know, just shoot us down like we nothing. We are nothing. So, uh, and 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 going to the wrong houses and killing people in their homes. Uh, this is something that should never happen because uh, things should have been better now than than uh, then because a lot of people uh, uh, died our rights and yet we are still killing us today it's time for for all of this injustice to stop and when i see the police getting off with just a, 
a tap on their hands, you know, just on their hands, look like that's what that's wrong. They got to stand. They got to go to the bar of justice, just like everybody else, because uh, this is something that should never happen to any anyone. And we see it on tape how uh, they kill innocent people. And it's time for uh, all of this to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things Dr. King does is he does end on a note of hope and optimism. And, you know, his speech uh, gave a lot of momentum to the movement and ultimately um, contributed to change albeit slow change and slow progress, but it was it was definitely a positive contribution to the movement. Um, what word of encouragement or hope do you have for, um, for people who are listening to this, who are paying attention, um, who are familiar with the struggle? The first thing come to my mind is to trust God, because I had to trust God to go through what I went through real and and, you know, at first I thought that the uh, alcohol and stuff like that was going to bring me through what I was going through. But after I got sober, I still had that same problem. Mm. And nowadays, we got to read his word and live according to the way he said and live. Because all of this, uh, uh, the alcohol and the drugs, it, it's just killing our bodies. But we got to learn how to get into the word of God. And, and live back. Amen. Amen. That's that's very powerful. Well, Sarah, again, I just want to say a big thank you for taking the time to uh, speak uh, on this important topic. It's your life's work, and it's a continuing work. Uh, so thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, it's encouraging also to see some of the success you've had, um, having progress to get recognition uh, through certain proclamations and through um, other things that you've been able to accomplish along the way. And it's our hope that um, you continue to see more of that success as you carry the banner. And um, we hope that listeners are encouraged by hearing about um, your story and um, how we can also be part of um, uh, the positive message going forward. So thank you again very much. And uh, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Rudolph. Thank you for your courage and leadership, your sacrifice, and your grace. What an honor to hear from you tonight. And now we get to hear another special guest. Um, our featured preacher tonight is Dr. Tama Bryant Davis. Dr. Tama is a licensed psychologist, ordained minister, and sacred artist who has worked nationally and globally to provide relief and empowerment to marginalized persons. She's a professor at Pepperdine University and a past president of the Society for the Psychology of Women. Her contributions to psychological research policy and practice have been honored by national and regional psychological associations. Dr. Tama earned her doctorate from Duke University, completed her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical Center, and is a past American Psychological Association representative to the United Nations. So she is quite established. She serves as a mental health media consultant for numerous print, radio, and television media outlets. And tonight, she's bringing us the word of God. Please welcome our minister tonight, Dr. Tama Bryant Davis. Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you, we honor you, we glorify you, we bless and magnify your most holy and righteous name. We give you praise because you alone are our God. And so I am so grateful to God for this opportunity to share a word from the Lord as we celebrate the life and legacy and sacrifice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Hallelujah. Our scripture on today comes from Amos 5, verses 21 to 24. 
I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Our theme for today is we've got to live it. We've got to live it. We are living in times that parallel the events occurring at the time of Amos. We see injustice in the land. We see racial discrimination, racism, hatred, bigotry. We see discrimination against our Asian brothers and sisters. We see anti-Black racism, discrimination against the Latinx community. We see hatred toward our immigrants. We see a disregard for Native American, American Indian, Indigenous peoples. We see a disrespect all over the land that is hostile, one that shows up in hate crimes, in violence and oppression. We see a mistreatment and discrimination against our Middle Eastern and Arab American brothers and sisters. We see it in the high places of our nation all the way to our day-to-day -day daily encounters. Not only do we see the discrimination, but we also see the violence. We see state-sanctioned violence. We see police brutality. We see racial profiling. We see even inequities in COVID-19 with black and brown people being disproportionately affected. We see mass death. Every day, the death rate is rising in our country, both those who are experiencing COVID-19 directly and those who have complications as a result of the disease. And we see even a disregard for those of us with pre-existing conditions. We see a disregard for our elders and the sacredness of their lives. We even see within our nation, just like Amos saw when he looked around, overlooking the dismissal, the erasure of the impoverished. We see people being blamed for their lack of resource while those who are operating out of greed are rewarded. We see disproportionate numbers of housing insecurity and food insecurity, yes, like Amos. We as the church in the contemporary uh, United States of America see injustice, see mass death, and see poverty all over the land. We are called to reflect on what our obligation and priority is to be as Christians. Jesus taught us that we are to serve, to love, to minister, to advocate. Jesus teaches that we are to serve, to love, to minister, to advocate. Following the example of Jesus Christ, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. lived a life of service, a life of love, a life of ministry, and a life of prophetic advocacy. It was prophetic in the sense that he heard from God and as a result of the message from God was activated to move. Even when religious and political people didn't like it, Dr. King put his life on the line for the least of these. They were not least of these because of their biology or because of their birth. They were treated as the least of these because of bigotry, of racism, of war, and of greed. In Dr. King's worship, he encountered God, and those encounters lit a fire of courageous engagement. And so we have to ask ourselves, after all of these worship services, Sunday after Sunday, have we really encountered God? When you have a genuine, authentic encounter with the Most High God, things cannot be the way that they were. When you have a genuine encounter with God, then your heart is moved on behalf of God's people. When I see, hear, and feel God, then I take on the mind of Christ and I am activated. If instead I am only engaging in religious ritual, there is no commitment, there is no fruit, 
There is no passion. There is no follow through. And so we must ask the question, with all of these worship services, have we actually worshiped? With all of these services, have we actually heard the very heartbeat of God? Because in reality, when we look at the text and study the gospel, we never see Jesus idealizing politicians or businessmen. And Dr. King, like Jesus, did not make the mistake of being charmed or manipulated by politicians. And Dr. King did not make the mistake of being bought by those who were wealthy. How do we live the life of faith that Amos prophesied about as he looked over the land and saw trouble everywhere? And just as King, all of those hundreds Hallelujah. Thousands of years later, looked all over these United States and saw trouble in the land. How do we live the life that Christ modeled? To live the life that Christ modeled and that King lived is to release our egos, to release greed, to release pettiness, to release selfishness, and to release bigotry. Are we willing as the church to really live the gospel that we claim to believe? According to the text, we recognize that we must resist the pull of fancy services that do not lead to service. How much time will we spend orchestrating and organizing emotional events that bear no fruit? 1 Corinthians 13 warns us that it is pointless, meaningless, powerless to engage in activity and not hold any love in our hearts. You see, great activists, when they are interviewed about their life sacrifice, declare that what mobilizes them to action is love for our people. And so the question becomes, who are the people that you love enough to speak up for? Who are the people that you love enough that you will fight for? Who is your neighbor? As we declare that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but so many times we are centered on accumulating wealth for ourselves while disregarding and discarding those who have been marginalized and disenfranchised. And so how do we demonstrate love? Amos calls for us to reach out to those who have been left behind, to reach for those who have been marginalized, to advocate for the racially marginalized, to advocate for the immigrants, both documented and undocumented, to advocate for the impoverished, to speak up for our elders and our youth, to speak up on behalf of the unemployed and those facing housing and food and job insecurity. Are we willing to speak up for people who are of other faiths? Are we willing to speak up for those of other sexualities? Are we willing to speak up for the incarcerated? Are we willing to speak up for widows? Are we willing to speak up for victims of violence? Dr. King said life's most persistent question is what are you doing for others? And so if we are to be the church that God called us to be, we must ask the question, what in the world are we doing for others? Service as King demonstrated is not just about action, but about the heart. That we are not fasting for a public display, but we are engaged in service because we believe that all of God's children are deserving of care, compassion, love, rights, and resources. When activists talk about being moved by love and compassion, they recognize that it is a sacrifice to get out of their comfort zone and move. And so Jesus pulls on our hearts today, just like he pulled on the heart of Dr. King to say, are you willing to get out of your comfort zone? Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. So with your life, your breath, your resources, I invite all of us to dream a bigger dream. 
a dream where we don't operate out of scarcity, a dream where we don't operate out of hoarding, a dream where we are not just looking to build bigger sanctuaries with empty empowerment, but instead to dream a bigger dream, a dream that will not just benefit your immediate family, a dream that will not just benefit members of your church, a dream that is not only about reward in the afterlife, but rights <coughs> and resource access in the present. Let me say that again. I invite us to dream a dream that is not just about a reward in the afterlife, but to dream a dream that is about rights and resource access in this life. We've got to live it. Come on, church, let's be the church. Let's be who God called us to be. Not only that, but Joel warns against singing mouths with stagnant feet. When you pray, move your feet. That is an African proverb. When you pray, move your feet. And so we sing great hymns, and I love hymns, and I love spirituals. But when it is all said and done, did the singing move us to action? Did the praying move us to action? Did all of our gathering mobilize and motivate us to help somebody along the way so that our living is not in vain? It is enough of us taking up offerings to enrich ourselves and build up our temples, but standing in opposition to a livable wage. God says enough is enough for the church, hallelujah, operating in silence or even actively blocking resources, services, and policies to help the least of these. Dr. King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. We claim to be friends of the least of these. We claim to be friends of the marginalized and the forgotten. But how many times have we been silent as they have been oppressed? How many times have we been silent in the face of anti-Black racism? How many times have we been silent as we see xenophobia running across the land? How many times have we been silent as we hear people perpetuating stereotype and stigma over those who are impoverished? As the church, we claim to be on the side of the oppressed, but have we spoken up and put our resources and our platform behind our words? Have we stopped with saying our thoughts and prayers are with you? Or have we actually mobilized to vote, to give, to empower, to serve those who are silenced, marginalized, and disenfranchised? What has the church lended, tended to God's name? What have we associated the name of Christ with? As I wept last week, watching the insurrection and seeing people hold the sign of Jesus Christ. I want us to really be thoughtful about what the church has signed on to actively or what we have signed on to by our silence in the face of sexism, bigotry, hatred, racism, exploitation, and xenophobia. Our work needs to move beyond crisis relief to liberation. We must move beyond silence to liberation. We have to move beyond an immediate care package and look at how we can advocate for people to have a livable wage, for people to have quality life, including quality health care, for people to be protected under the law and within the law, for us to really be the church. We have to come out of the comfort of our silence and actually speak, to give voice to the prophetic urgency of all of God's children deserving love and care and protection. So how do we align with righteousness? We call for it. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. And when do we want it? Now. Dr. King said the time is always right to do what is right. We use our voices, agency, influence, resources, and power 
to demand racial justice and economic justice and equity, to be aware that silence supports the status quo. And so when the church is silent, we give our consent for the status quo. When we are silent, then we give permission for discrimination and bigotry to run rampant. When we are silent, Jesus weeps. When churches are silent about police brutality and racial disparities in healthcare and education, Jesus weeps. When churches claim to be multicultural while, per while perpetrating the myth that the only acceptable image of our Savior has white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes, Jesus weeps. Where are the prophets, not the false prophets whose claims have been revealed as false? Hallelujah. But we are looking for the real prophets who hear from the true and living and loving God. Where are the prophets that have a heart for liberation? The prophets that have a heart for equity? Where is the church that has a heart to dismantle oppression in all of its forms? This is the bride of Christ that we are waiting for. We are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we have been waiting for. So let the church arise and God's enemies be scattered. Let the church arise and bigotry and oppression be scattered. Let the church arise. Look and live, my brothers and sisters, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Look at the work of King, but do not fall into the trap of believing he was some other type of divine being that is beyond our reach. He used his gifts and his voice to call for justice because of his great love for God and God's people. And so I will not sugarcoat it for us today. Dr. King paid with his life. He has a holiday today but he, they took his life. He did not just pass away. He was assassinated because of his commitment to justice and those who organized systematically to destroy him and attempted to kill the dream for racial justice. Jesus was also murdered by the state because he called for us to be joint heirs in the kingdom because he disrupted the status quo because he called out inequity in the political and religious system, and so they murdered him. When you speak out about racism and oppression, it will cost you. Some will call you divisive, but don't let that stop you. Some will say you're being negative, but don't let that stop you. Some will say fighting justice Fighting for justice is a distraction and we should just focus on heaven, but don't let that stop you. The Lord's prayer declares that God's will should be done on earth as it is in heaven. The word declares that Jesus came that we might have an abundant life, not just after death, but right here and right now. And so may the love of God and the life of King provoke us to do more than church attendance, more than just sing and raise money for grander sanctuaries. Let us actually live the gospel. Take up your cross and live. It will cost you when you speak up for racial justice. It it will cost us when the church finally takes a stand for righteousness, but our silence has cost more. Too many people have suffered because the church has been silent. And so as King noted, our lives begin to end. The day we become silent about things that matter, we've got to live. Live it by loving each other. Live it by serving and empowering each other. Live it by working for justice until it rolls down like a mighty stream. Look and live. My brothers and sisters live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that we look and live. And so may the spirit of the living God Awaken each of us that we will live, love, fight, sacrifice for justice, for righteousness, for all of God's children. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Tama. Boy, did we receive a word tonight. Wow. Let the church arise, she said. 
She said that Jesus disrupted the status quo and called out injustice in his time. And she said, Jesus calls us today to speak out against injustice. And she made it clear too that when you speak out against injustice, it's going to cost you something. But don't let it stop you, she said. Don't let it stop you. Keep loving each other and serving each other and keep dreaming a dream of justice. Amen and amen. Thank you, Sister Tama, for that powerful word for this evening. Ah, but we are not done yet. The hits keep coming. We have another special guest headed our way. For over a decade, Saul Paul has earned an international reputation as a musician with a message. Known for entertaining and inspiring audiences across the world, Saul Paul uses his platform to promote social good and advocate for youth. He has performed at two TEDx talks and has appeared on America's Got Talent and at some of the world's most esteemed music festivals. And he has collaborated with artists from around the world. Let's listen in now as we hear from Grammy nominated musician, author and speaker, Saul Paul. What's up, world? It's your boy, Saul Paul. Hey, so um, welcome to this special edition of Saul Paul Presents. Uh, thank you to the Grove Center for the invitation. Uh, normally when I do this, I'm going behind the scenes of an event, an activity, a function, a person, or whatever it may be. But uh, today, I'm going behind the scenes on a text, actually a speech. Uh, Dr. King, I have a dream speech. Now, there's a certain part that I was uh, encouraged to, to, to read, to, to meditate on, to, and to share my thoughts. So I'm going to do that. Uh, there were some key lines in there that stood out to me. I'll speak to that. There's also a scripture that was provided. Amos 5, 21 through 24. I sat on that as well, and I'll, I'll speak to that. I'll bring it all together and end it with the song. So let's get to it. Now, the tagline for this is... Righteousness like a mighty stream. The first thing I noticed is um, the genius of Dr. King. Now, I've always known he's been intelligent. I've always known uh, he was quite strategic. Uh, everything he did, he did on purpose, with the purpose, as he walked in his purpose. But uh, it was encouraging, because I saw that he does something that I do. Uh, righteousness like a mighty stream. That's a phrase that's found in his I Have a Dream speech. And it's a phrase that's also found in the Bible. So it was cool to see that he would take his scripture uh, and injecting it into his speeches uh, as he was walking out his God-given purpose. So that, uh, that encouraged me. That stood out. Uh, I believe that's one reason why his uh, speeches, not just this one, but many of his speeches have stood the test of time because they have they originated from a timeless text in the Bible. And that's powerful. Um, I'll just read the beginning. Check this out. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. That was um, eye-opening because, right, that, that basically, I know this is from 60 years ago, but it really sounds like it could have been just six days, six weeks ago. Uh, there's still work to do, and we're still doing the work. Shout out to all those that are doing the work. But uh, shout out to Dr. King, who uh, blazed the trail, paved the path. And someone like myself, uh, a black male, can benefit from the sacrifice that he made. Uh, they can walk and, and reap the benefit and the fruit of the sacrifice that he made. So. He's impacted my life so much so that uh, one of my major projects is called Dreaming 3D, and it was really me taking the baton from him, right? I have a dream, and then me taking that baton and moving, continuing on with uh, Dreaming in 3D. My take on making our dreams a reality, especially those God-given ones, right? Like, it's so much bigger than us. Uh, I'm always encouraged, because I realize, like, just like Jesus, he wasn't murdered in vain. Like his life meant something, uh, and it was all part of God's plan. 
that God used it. Uh, and I believe that Dr. King had some awareness of uh, God's purpose and plan for his life. So he had the confidence and the courage to walk that path out, uh, just like Jesus. And that encourages me and that continually speaks to me because I realize that my dreams, just like you, uh, many of our dreams, like they don't just originate with us, they were given to us. And God has a plan and it's worthy to put in the work to birth those dreams. So I really appreciate Dr. King with the path that he set. Dr. King was amazing. I'm his legacy, his legacy lives on through me. I'm also the legacy of uh, Curly Collins, that's my grandmother. So my grandmother raised me. She raised me because my mother passed away when I was three. My father, he abandoned me before I was born. I was in foster care. My amazing grandmother swooped in like Wonder Woman. She adopted me, she raised me, and she invested in me. She showed, she, she showed me love and she sowed seeds of greatness. She sowed the word into my life. And though she passed away, I recognize that I'm her legacy. She lives on through me. Just like Dr. King sowed seeds into America, he sowed seeds into so many people. His legacy lived on and continues to live on. He continues to be the change. My most recent project is called Beat the Change. The fact is we all stay on the same planet. The truth is we each live in our own world. Now, I encourage people to be the change in the world they live in. That puts the responsibility back on you. So you don't have to look left and look right and, and hope those people do what they're supposed to do and hope those people do what they're supposed to do. But you recognize that you have a sphere of influence and that you can do what you're supposed to do. Do what you're called to do and you can walk in your purpose and you can be the change. And me, I'm a songwriter, so I write songs. I wrote a song about it. It's called Be the Change. And here that is. I've been thinking about it, I should be the change Ain't no doubt about it, it's time to be the change Ain't no way around it if you're tired of the same Oh, now is the time to be the change Be the change, be the change Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, oh, oh yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh. Question, we all human, right? Then we should all have basic human right. And if I'm doing right, and if I'm doing well, then I probably shouldn't sit and watch my neighbor fail. We could all prevail, we could all succeed. But I gotta be the change, I must be the lead. So I guess I lend a helping hand, show love to my neighbor, help them stand. I've been thinking about it, I should be the change. Ain't no doubt about it, it's time to be the change. Ain't no way around it if you're tired of the same. Oh, now is the time to be the change, be the change, be the change. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Be the change. I love it. I love it. And I hope you were moved by that word too. What a fresh, inspiring message and song from Saul Paul. Thank you very much, Saul Paul, for sharing with us this night. Our next speaker is Dr. Nicholas Pierce, a scholar, speaker, entrepreneur, and pastor. Dr. Nicholas Pierce is an award-winning professor of management and organizations at the Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. He's the founder and chief executive officer of the Vocati Group and assistant pastor of Chicago's historic Apostolic Church of God. He's also the author of The Purpose Path, a guide to pursuing your authentic life's work. Let's hear another compelling word from Dr. Nicholas Pierce. Tonight's reflection on the legacy and dream of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. focuses on righteousness 
like a mighty stream. It was the prophet Amos who wrote, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. What Amos was saying was on behalf of God to God's people. And what God was telling the people was basically, spare me your worship services if you reject righteousness and justice in the social order. You're going through the motions of outward religiosity, but if you don't have a heart of righteousness and justice toward one another, just stop it. (laughs) In other words, God was not satisfied and neither should we be satisfied with an outward expression of Christian faith and values that has not first manifested in how we show up in the public square. Our Christian faith cannot be a Sunday morning only practice at the altar or a salve to soothe our weary consciences. The call to follow Jesus Christ is the urgent call to be transformed from the inside out. It is the urgent, penetrating call of the kingdom that the Lordship of Jesus Christ would be established, not only in the heart of every believer, but in every home and on every block and every community and every church and every business, every government on the face of the earth, every civic and cultural institution and in every corner of God's creation. This means that, as Dr. King said, we can't be satisfied as long as black children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity, as long as people of color are sub-optimized in workplaces and marketplaces across the length and breadth of this country. We can't be satisfied as long as there is a widening racial wealth gap. We cannot be satisfied as long as there's a widening racial achievement gap. We can't be satisfied as long as there is a racial health care gap. We can't be satisfied as long as there is systemic racial inequality in employment and the housing system and the so-called justice system. You may say, we have a Latina Supreme Court justice. We had a black president. There's a black CEO of this company. There's an Asian CEO of that company. Or maybe my favorite one, I have a black friend, so I'm not racist. But we all know that's not enough. If we claim to be the people of the God of all creation, then we cannot be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an unstoppable mighty stream. We cannot claim victory until righteousness covers the earth and until justice is the standard. We can't claim victory until God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And our prayer tonight is, Lord, let it begin in us, with us. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Thank you for your profound insights. Your words have been bold and refreshing for us this week, so we really appreciate you sharing with us. And now we have the privilege of hearing a short message from another special guest, Mr. Bob Dahl. Bob Dahl is the Senior Portfolio Manager and Chief Equity Strategist for Nuveen Investments. And he has a word for us tonight. Please welcome Mr. Bob Dahl. In his Righteous Like a Mighty Stream speech, Dr. King quoted the book of Amos. I hate I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. And then he goes on to say why there's a rejection, and he ends with, but let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is a sober passage. These are not comforting words. Basically, God is saying, if we neglect issues of justice and righteousness, then even the best worship and gifts are unacceptable to him. Throughout the book of Amos, we're confronted with a just God that deals in justice. He's angered when those in power take advantage of those who do not have power. He despises the abuse of power because those in authority have been given the responsibility of making sure that justice is done. 
earlier in the book, Amos the prophet lists these actions that are an anathema to the Lord. They include selling people into slavery in order to pay small debts, ignoring the poor and corrupt business practices. The powerful preyed upon the weak and altered the practices of the society so that the rich grew richer at the expense of the poor. In the midst of this injustice and inequity, the people would offer their sacrifices. They didn't challenge the system, nor did they really care about the poor. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants all creation to experience the fullness of God's kingdom. This is not some sweet by and by when we die, but the abundant experience of God's love, grace, provision, justice, and inclusion in the here and now. Jesus continued the concern about the injustices of his day, especially as they would relate to the scribes and the Pharisees. He condemned them. He spoke out against them. He worked actively to correct them. He taught his disciples and you and me to get the log out of our own eyes so we could see clearly. And a civil war until equal protection was finally written into the Constitution. We know this is the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, ending slavery, recognizing the citizenship of those who had been held in slavery and promised equal protection under the law and guaranteed the right to vote. But as a society, we're not there yet. And we are probably not moving fast enough. We need to press for more progress and attempt better solutions. Housing patterns, access to adequately funded education programs, the risk of being incarcerated and arrested, economic opportunity, the promised equal protection of the law, all of these things. Amos called for justice. He also calls for compassion. What is compassion like? What is a compassionate life? Time doesn't permit me to get into a lot of details. Let me just suggest that compassion contains, one, justice or righteousness, two, shalom or peace, three, compassion or love. Now, how do we practice the compassionate life? We have to be willing. We have to be informed. I mean, we need to get the facts. We need to dig in, get our uh, hands dirty, and we need to get involved influencing public policy. Showing the world an alternative way of living, of love and acceptance, of peace and freedom, of hope and vision, of nurture and accountability. We love one another so that the world will declare, see how they love one another. Wouldn't that be great to hear? The deepest and most common idea of a righteous person in the Bible isn't just a decent person who doesn't lie and steal or take bribes. It's a person who actively goes out of their way to stand up for the needy and the vulnerable and make sure they're taken care of. It's not passive or reactive. It's active and affirming. In Amos's time, the prayers and songs of God's people sounded off key in God's ears. Why? Because they poured a flood of prayers and offerings and songs of praise to God but justice and righteousness didn't fill their lives and flow out like a mighty stream. The problem was their worship had become internally focused. Maybe their goal was to check the box. They got tunnel vision. They wanted to forget about their sins, their problems, their struggles. But when they did that, they also forgot about the suffering war world outside their assembly. In Dr. King's speech, we read these words. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. How blatant and obviously prejudicial and justice persecution when it says for whites only. Despicable. Fast forward a few decades to today, we've gotten rid of the signs, but have our hearts really changed? While the optimist in me says we've made good progress, the realist in me says we still have a long way to go. The realist in me also recognizes from Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If we truly practice justice and righteousness, justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Three, three things I did as a result of the summer of heightened racism. One, gave a meaningful amount of money to a Black-owned and managed business to train young Black professionals' leadership skills. Two, helped start an organization called Churches Helping Churches, where poor minority churches received dollars for survival during COVID from churches and individuals with means. And number three, lent my assistance 
to a movement to raise potentially a quarter of a billion dollars to be invested with black owners of businesses to help them get back on their feet post COVID. These may just sim be simply three drops in a big bucket, but all of us, whether we're black, white, purple, we need to get involved and do our part. Second Corinthians four is not an excuse in order to get, give us an out or a pass, but it does give us the proper perspective. It says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, that's what this is, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We're to live in this truth of who we are in Jesus Christ. We are pilgrims and strangers. We're just people passing through this world on our way home. Along the way, we may become disillusioned, defeated, discouraged, but we don't have to lose heart. God can and will help us make the journey with glory in our souls if we keep our eyes on him and not what we see. We read in Revelation and know that the day will come when we will say, quote, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the former things have passed away. And the one seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I long for the day when righteousness and justice will be perfectly administered. Even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Amen. Thank you, Bob Dahl. Thank you for taking us through the word and helping us dig a little deeper into Dr. King's message for this week. We appreciate your insights. And now we're blessed to hear once again from Pastor Michael Allen. He's the co-founder and chief strategy officer for Together Chicago which brings together churches, businesses, and government leadership to bring transformation to Chicago communities. He's on the front lines, and he has another word for us tonight. Welcome again, Pastor Michael Allen. In Amos chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the prophet Amos chronicles God's lament against Israel because of Israel's blatant and rampant injustice to the poor and the mar marginalized of their day. He also warns them. He warns about the judgment to come from God upon his own people who perpetrate injustice. Dr. King once again makes a very vivid list of the injustices suffered by Negroes. While, he ans while answering the question posed by some, when those engaged in the civil rights struggle would be satisfied. That was the question, when will you be satisfied? Well, by making a list of the specific injustices, that list became a target, a target at which civil rights activists could aim to make changes in the systems that promoted those injustices. At the same time, Dr. King recognized that, he recognized what Paul did in 2 Corinthians 4. Believers will always face trials in this life. Therefore, we must be we must not be surprised and we must not lose heart. We must not be discouraged, but continue the struggle for justice. He urged his people to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. The faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Again, he made a clear distinction, which I think has been lost today. The distinction between suffering for righteousness sake that is unearned suffering, as opposed to suffering, the suffering that one brings upon oneself because of breaking just laws or being disrespectful or non-compliant to police officers, for example. Such behavior often ends in what Dr. King would call earned suffering. And so he asks us in this section of his eloquent speech, to persevere with faith, the faith that comes from unearned suffering. Thank you, Pastor Allen, for that brief yet very profound 
and a challenging message. Your words have blessed us this week and we are very grateful for your willingness to share with us. And now another special treat. We get to hear a brief word from Ray Lewis, the Hall of Fame running back from the Baltimore Ravens, a well-known name. He's going to bless us with a word right now, a challenging word. Welcome, Ray Lewis. And look, I kind of went through it. I jotted some stuff down, but this one, this one statement has many layers to it. I mean, so much biblical connotation in it. It's, it's, it's amazing, right? But in our quest for true freedom, many of us have experienced agony and pain and unwarranted abuse, right? Suffering is redemptive, right? It gives us, it gives meaning to the true experience of human suffering. When we go through seasons of undeserved pain and suffering, don't lose faith because God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. This statement, MLK statement, is speaking directly to the heart of where we are right now in America with social injustice and police brutality. He's encouraging us, the people, to keep the faith, faith in the midst of hardship, trials, and tribulations. Know that in the end, God will save us. Psalms 34, 18, God is near the brokenhearted. He is, he is with us when we're forced to endure unearned suffering. God bless you all. And I hope you understand that God is always available. Thank you, Ray Lewis, for that heartfelt message. Uh, what a privilege to hear from you tonight. And now we've come to the end to our final uh, message tonight, our final speaker. We're honored to be able to hear again from Mr. William Adjay, who's the managing director of CBRE. Welcome, William, as he concludes our evening tonight. You know, as uh... We've dialogued around uh, this important week and Dr. Dr. King's speech, um, as we've also uh, interacted with a number of folks here. There are three things that stand out for me. Um, number one, um, the amazing power of the speech in and of itself. Uh, there isn't a soul that can listen to a recording of that speech or watch the video. It's on YouTube and not walk away uh, really shaken to the core um, about the importance and the timing and the significance of that speech. Um, number two, it wasn't just a speech for the moment, uh, but it was a speech for the ages. It, it borrowed from uh, 100 years before. And uh, one of the remarkable things as we have spoken to folks uh, for this year's uh, memorial is just the fact that uh, that speech still speaks um, decades and decades after um, it was uh, actually, uh, you know, I, I, when he actually spoke it. Um, and, and really the fact that the truths and the ideas and the concepts and the themes that were laid out back then that were so pertinent and important continue to be extremely vital and important and significant even in our day. And who would have thought, especially coming off of a year like 2020, um, at the beginning of which nobody would have anticipated the kind of year we would have had to have a speech this old be just as impactful, just as relevant uh, is amazing. And then maybe the third thing is the resilience that you sense from a lot of people. There isn't a sense of resignation or, um, you know, just giving up, but there is a, uh, on the one hand, imbalance uh, an agitation, a quiet, persistent, strong agitation that work still needs to be done, combined with uh, some optimism and some hope that uh, all the uh, pressing on is not futile and is not in vain. So those are some of the themes that, that uh, for me, um, have really hit home this week as we've been having a lot of discussions. Thank you, William, Ad Jay, for those concluding thoughts. Uh, your word and your words and leadership have been uh, a blessing throughout this week. Well, 
that brings us to the end of another evening of our special week-long remembrance of Dr. King's dream. We hope you were inspired, challenged, and motivated to be an active participant in what God is doing in the world to disrupt injustice and, in and inequity, and to open the way for justice to, as we've been saying tonight, roll down like a mighty stream. Amen. So some next steps. The Growth Center of Northern Seminary is dedicated to bringing Christian leaders together to learn through events just like this one. And you can support the important work that they are doing and keep events like these available for free of charge by supporting the Growth Center. You can donate online by going to seminary.edu and sharing whatever you can there to keep events like this going. To stay connected and informed on future events, please follow the Grow Center on social media at Grow Center Network. And of course, join us again tomorrow night at 8 p.m. as we look at the next section of Dr. King's speech, Together at the Table. We'll be hearing from Pastor Albert Tate, gospel legend Vicki Winans, Olympic gymnast Gabby Douglas, and Danielle Forte, who's the founder of What's your for the What's Your Forte Foundation and 828 Clothing. So make sure to be here tomorrow night. You will not want to miss it. Until then, may you go in peace, knowing that our God of peace, our God of love, our God of justice goes before us. Amen and amen.